Hey guys, so today we are going to start um, looking at the economy in this class in terms of how the government um, creates policy with the economy. And we're going to start off with just some basics and then we are going to look at the very first type of economic policy, which is fiscal policy. There will be a follow up video that will talk about monetary policy. So to start off with, we need to talk about a question that has come up quite a bit, which is what is the government's role in the economy? And as with many, many things that we've talked about in this class, it depends on your ideology. So for conservatives, the government's role is fewer regulations, right? Decreasing the cost of government to encourage spending in the economy. Liberals, on the other hand, favor more government involvement to stimulate the economy, increasing government costs for the sake of improving the economy itself. And this role has changed over time. From the very beginning um, of our country, we started really with this idea of laissez-faire capitalism or economics, this idea that opposes government interference in economic affairs beyond what is necessary to protect life and property, right? It's kind of that hands-off is what that means. We then, again, talking about um, FDR and the New Deal and the Great Depression move to what is called Keynesian economics. And this is the idea that government spending should increase during business slumps and be curbed during booms. And we'll talk about a slump versus a boom here in a minute. But during the Great Depression, we needed an economic theory to help us understand what was happening. And then we have a, an, a, an era of what we call supply side economics. Um, this is also another name for this would be Reaganomics um, from the Reagan administration. And the idea of this is that um, you want to stimulate the supply of goods, especially through cutting tax rates. And the idea is that by cutting taxes, so reducing the amount of government involvement and cutting those taxes, this will trickle down and benefit all of society by promoting investment. Now, today our government has three goals with the economy. Promote maximum employment, promote maximum production, fight inflation, those high prices. Um, and just to give you guys uh, some ideas of our, of our budget and things like that, in 2019, our government spent $4.45 trillion. We are $23.16 trillion in debt, and we operate at a $984 billion deficit, which is the amount that we overspent in a year. So the economy in our country is huge. Okay. Now, here we have the typical capitalistic economy, the typical shape of the business cycle. So as you can see, there are ebbs and there are flows. Um, this is a natural cycle, right? If you are talking about competition and business and tax rates, um, you're going to have periods of growth, but you're also going to have periods of downturn. And we call those periods of growth booms. And we call those periods of downturns, recessions, and slumps, or depressions if they get um, that bad. So at the bottom of this business cycle, typically the biggest problem faced is unemployment, the percentage of people who are not employed and who are looking for a job. And then as we start through the recovery period, up through economic expansion and a boom, um, we typically see inflation, uh, the, the rising price in um, items and goods, but the uh, value of the purchasing dollar stays the same. So this is the model that we'll be looking at as we look at the other types of economic policy. Okay, now economy basics, there are really two uh, forms that economic policy can take, whether it's fiscal or monetary, and the first is expansionary. So expansionary policy is used to stimulate the economy and create growth. So expansionary policy, whether it's fiscal or monetary, is going to occur when we are in periods of economic downturn, whether that's a recession or a depression or a slump when there's a lot of unemployment, when unemployment is high. There is also contractionary fiscal and monetary policy, and this is used to slow down or restrict economic growth. So this will be used during those booms or during periods of really rapid economic growth, right? And I know that sounds kind of funny, like why would we want to slow down or restrict growth? But think about it like this, right? If something grows too quickly, the economy can collapse. And I always like to use this idea 
think of a kid when they're just learning to walk or run and they get going way, way, way too fast and they get tripped up on their feet and they fall down. That's what our economy can do if it grows too quickly. So we use contractionary policies to slow that down. Now, fiscal policy is the spending, taxing, and borrowing actions taken by the federal government, whether that's the president or Congress. And this money comes from several places. The first would be the federal income tax, where we get 40% almost of our total revenue. This is our largest source of revenue. Um, this here is a progressive tax. So the higher the income and ability to pay, the higher the tax rate that that person pays. Um, and this is on individuals and corporations. We then have social insurance taxes that fund the Social Security and Medicare programs. Um, employers apply these taxes to their employees who then receive those social insurance programs. Borrowing, um, the government will regularly borrow money, most of it from its taxpayers. And then deficit spending occurs at this point too, especially with borrowing, um, when the government spends more money than it takes in within a given fiscal year. Um, other uh, sources of reven revenue, excuse me, for fiscal policy would be excise taxes uh, levied on goods and services like liquor, gasoline, um, estate taxes, customs, duties, and tariffs um, levied on goods imported into the United States. Right. So something to note, just talking about the budget, each year the president will submit a federal budget for approval by Congress for money to be spent. So this is that spending, taxing, borrowing piece of fiscal policy. Um, and again, proposed by the president, approved by Congress. So where does this money go then? Um, this money goes toward entitlement programs that are required by law, like Social Security, and are given to people meeting those eligibility requirements like we've talked about. Um, the national defense as well, this money will go towards. In 2019, we spent $686.1 billion in national defense, right? National debt, we are in debt. We have to pay interest on that debt and other items as well, like highway construction, education, housing, and foreign aid. Um, so just to give you an idea, um, mandatory spending, 38% of our revenue went to Social Security, just to give you an idea of how this is broken down. And then I do have here the 2020 budget request. So as you can see, when we talk about national defense, um, this is something that has increased in recent years um, and is, is increased as well um, for 2020, where uh, we spend $718 billion on defense. So fiscal policy in action, um, something that we see a lot. So let's pretend that we're in a depression, okay, an economic downturn. We're going down or we're at that bottom with a lot of unemployment. Um, we will spend more, and by we I mean the government, than we receive in taxes to stimulate the economy and collect less, right? If we're down, we want to grow the economy and stimulate it. So long story short, bad economy, we will increase spending, and we will borrow uh, or increase our spending and increase borrowing, and we will lower our taxes. So this is an example of expansionary fiscal policy. On the other hand, during a boom, when we're at that really high point where inflation is uh, risky, we will collect more in taxes to slow spending and economic growth. So if the economy is growing too quickly, long story short, we will raise taxes, right? Because if we raise taxes, that means the consumer has to pay more or they lose more money to taxes and they have less to spend. The government will also cut spending and cut borrowing as well, an example of contractionary fiscal policy. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about the other type of economic policy then, which is monetary policy. Um, and this here, this broad definition is basically instead of taxing and borrowing and spending, we're looking at how the government regulates and controls the money supply or the amount of money in circulation. And that is done through printing or coining money. Um, and the goal of this, like I said before, is to fight inflation. Um, and inflation essentially happens when there is too much money out in circulation, 
um, the devaluation of the dollar, essentially, when the cost of a good or service increases, but the value of it doesn't. Um, and just as an example, um, this typically happens in periods of high growth, but as an example, I want you to think about these um, statistics here. So in 1966, get this, you could buy a new house for $23,000 and a gallon of gas costs 32 cents. Okay, let that sink in. Now, today, right, you can build a new house, but that's going to cost you $313,000. A gallon of gas is hovering around the $2.50 mark. Okay, so that is example of um, the issue of inflation here, right? We have the increase in goods and services, but the value of our dollar has not changed. Okay. Um, we will be talking about this as well. Just like with fiscal policy and the economy, um, there is an ideological divide. Um, and like I said, I'll bring this up later, but just think about it this way, right? Uh, conservatives and liberals are going to have different ideas as to how to use monetary policy to affect the economy. Right. Now, the arm of the government that is going to regulate monetary policy um, is the Federal Reserve. And this was created in 1913 with the Federal Reserve Act. What this did was created 12 Federal Reserve banks known as the Fed. And I want you guys to think about it like this is the banker's bank, right? The bank has to get its money from somewhere. So this controls the money supply that banks can lend out. And we'll talk about this too as we go through this, but that is called the reserve requirement, the amount of money that banks um, have to lend out and have to keep on hand. The Fed also sets interest rates and discount rates, um, basically the fee that there is for borrowing money. Now, something that sets the Fed apart from fiscal policy and things like that is that this is an independent agency. It's independent of government control, right? Yes, the board members are appointed by the president and approved by the Senate, but the president cannot remove them from office before their terms are up, okay? Um, so this really removes the Fed from political pressures, um, which is the purpose, right? If you're affecting the economy, it shouldn't be about what the president wants or does not want. Okay. So when we're looking at setting interest rates, we're going to be talking about um, this quite a bit, but we're going to be looking at how this interest rate and discount rate, along with the reserve requirement, uh, changes the amount of money that we have in circulation, thanks to the Fed. So let's use an example. Okay. Let's say that we're in a depression. So to bring back this chart, right? we said a depression is when we have an economic downturn. Okay, now the Fed is all about controlling the amount of money in circulation. So, of course, if we are down, we want to try and increase the amount of money in circulation and an amount of money available even to encourage spending and borrowing. So, ultimately, the Fed's goal for this expansionary policy is to make it easier for people to get a loan, to borrow money, right, to uh, essentially uh, we want to lower that interest rate. We want to lower the fee that one has to pay in order to actually get a loan from a bank, right? Because if that amount is low, you're going to be more likely to borrow. The Fed is also going to decrease the reserve requirement. So what that means is the banks don't have to keep as much on hand. So let's say, and this isn't the actual amount, but let's say that on average, the Fed requires a bank to have $10,000 on reserve at all times, okay? Now, if we're in a depression, the Fed is gonna decrease that reserve requirement and it's gonna say, okay, banks, you just have to keep $8,000 on hand at all times. So what that has done is actually given the bank $2,000 more to be able to loan out, thus putting more money into the economy. Now, on the other side of things, with contractionary monetary policy during inflation, the Fed is gonna try and decrease the amount of money available, right? And this is to discourage spending. So when we're in that economic boom, when inflation is high, right, where there's that high price, um, the Fed 
is actually going to raise interest rates, raise the discount rate, those fees that banks and individuals have to pay to take out loans. Um, and that's gonna make it harder for people to get a loan or to borrow money. And they'll also increase that reserve requirement. So using my example from before, let's say that the reserve requirement is back to $10,000. Well, now to contract, right, the Fed is gonna say, banks, you need to keep $12,000 on hand at all times. That's $2,000 uh, less now that the banks have to loan out. So that is going to decrease the amount of money in circulation. So to recap, okay, that reserve requirement is that amount of money that banks are required to keep with the Federal Reserve on hand at all times, okay? That's to prevent all money from being taken out and causing financial panic. So let's say that we hire the reserve requirement that leads to less money in circulation. The lower the reserve requirement, the more money there is in circulation. Okay. We'll do the same thing here with adjusting the discount and interest rate, right? This amount that the Fed would charge banks to borrow money and then the banks charge consumers, right? Money's not free. Don't let anyone tell you that money is not is free, okay? You're always gonna have to pay it back. But if we increase or raise interest rates, the less borrowing happens, right? You're gonna be more likely to take out a loan if you only have to pay back um, 1% versus 5%, right? That changes the amount of money that you have to pay back. On the other hand, the lower the interest rate, the more borrowing happens, right? If that goes down and you have to pay back less, you're gonna be more likely to take out a loan. So, what is the answer, right? We've spent some time talking about fiscal versus monetary policy. Um, the answer is who you ask, right? This is where ideology comes into play. So conservatives generally favor monetary policy um, to stabilize the economy. Um, conservatives consider fiscal actions like that taxing, spending, and borrowing of the government as wasteful social programs, budget deficits, high interest rates. Um, basically, is a waste of uh, government resources. Um, liberals, on the other hand, consider monetary policy too slow and weak to address the sudden and drastic declines that our economy often faces. Um, specifically, liberals point out that lower interest rates generated by monetary policy will fail to stimulate that economy. Um, borrowers will be reluctant to add to their debt during those hard economic times. So as a result, Liberals tend to favor more public spending on infrastructure, education, unemployment benefits, uh, those demand-boosting projects. Um, we also have to consider uh, the political side of fiscal versus monetary policy, right? Uh, no one wants to be the president or congressman that raises taxes. Right. So what we see, too, is a political side on both ideologies, even favoring monetary policy. So while both are used, right, we are seeing a lot of leaning toward monetary policy um, for that political uh, purpose.